Welcome to this week's True House Stories. I'm Lenny Fontana coming out of New York City. And like I said, this man is one of the hardest, if not the hardest working man in show business in this dance music industry. As a DJ myself and as well as him, I've seen him all over the world traveling from continent to continent, jumping back out of in and out of New York, in the studio, out of the studio. There was a time I remember he was remixing probably every day, if I remember correctly, back in the 90s, remixing like crazy every major label record that had that Louis Vega and that Masters of Work sound. And then you would catch him on a Wednesday night playing an underground network, firing out new hit records that were coming out, not just from himself, but also as the DJ, he'd be promoting a lot of our stuff too. And he helped make a lot of careers happen along the way. And we have to thank him for that as well, because his DJing is, is a tremendous attribute to what he does, aside from the prolific catalog of Louis Vega as the writer, producer, Grammy winner, and now Grammy nominated again. Congrats again. So we like to welcome Mr. Louis Vega. Thank you, Lou. Welcome, brother. I know I have no background crowd. Yeah, where's my, where's my crowd at? Yeah. <laughs> and again, thanks again for doing it. Um, um, where do we begin? So, so much to cover with you. God, let's just start simple. You know, young kid, we know you have a mom and dad. I've asked this question from all my friends and artists that come on. Where does music find a young Louis Vega? Well, you know, uh, first of all, on the radio. You know, we used to listen to uh, WABC, of course. And, um, and that was a great time because that was a time when uh, pop music was Earth, Wind & Fire, Elt uh, Elton John. You know what I'm saying? It was uh, all of our favorites uh, that we play now. And, and um, you know, with, with the classics and stuff. But um, Stevie Wonder, you know, um, it was just a, a, a wonderful time with music. And, and, and I think a, a lot of us, at that, in that era, we, uh, we were kind of an old soul, you know, young kids hearing this sophisticated sound, but, you know, we were loving it. You know what I'm saying? It was, it was, our, it was our thing. It's funny because when, you know, when you're a kid, you know, my parents always listen to like Fania records and, and all the Latin music and stuff. And, and, um, you know, I, I went more, uh, towards listening to, uh, the soul sound on, on radio, but as well hearing that at home, you know, so um, for me, there was a lot going on, you know, there, there was my father playing uh, a tenor, tenor sax, you know, uh, um, he, he played jazz and he, he was in, in bands and um, he also played uh, salsa music. So I heard him rehearsing at home and listening to Miles Davis and John Coltrane, you know, Charlie Parker. I mean, you know, those were his favorites. And, um, you know, uh, at the same time, my sisters were uh, disco queens, you know what I'm saying? But at that time, you're talking early 70s, you know, my older sister, uh, one of my older sisters, Myrna, uh, I mean, she went to the loft in like 71, I believe it was. So, you know, she's been in the scene for many years and bringing home that music. And as well, after her, Edna, uh, who was my other sister, who's a little younger than Myrna, uh, she went to the Paradise Garage and, and, and the Loft as well and all these places. So all that music was, you know, running through my ears when I was a kid, just, you know, six, seven, eight years old. And, um, you know, it was just uh, about running down to that record store two blocks away because I'm from the Bronx, you know, um, lived on Stratford <laughs> Avenue and um, on Westchester Avenue, which was like a block away two blocks from my grandmother's house and one block from my mom's house. I used to run down there and always go to hear this new sound disco that was, you know, at, coming out at the time I was like, you know, nine, 10 years old, you know, um, and then buying some of the old soul records, you know what I mean? Booker T and the MGs and, and all this stuff. I was buying 45s. So uh, I wasn't DJing obviously at that age, but I was uh, into music already and, and starting to buy it, you know? Then it wasn't until I met um, a friend of mine that lived on the same block. When I hung out with him, uh, we used to go to uh, where he lived in his apartment and um, we went into his big brother's room. Yeah. And the big brother, he had the turntables. 
he had the GLI 9000. He had the break. Oh, wow. Okay. You know, he had the break beats and we were like, wow, what is this? This is great. And then when, you know, the big brother wasn't there, we were listening to all the break beats. And at the same time, you know, there were block parties happening. Do you know, know do you know, can you date the year that was about? You would. We're talking now, um, 76, 77. Okay. Around there. I was about 11, 12 years old. And, um, you know, um, 76, when I was 11, 10, 11 years old. And um, when uh, we would listen to the break beats, it was like, oh, let's do like the, the guys do, on, the DJs do on the block parties. Because we used to go to the, you know, the block parties were right down on the street there, you know, happening in the summertime. And we would hear the DJs extending these, you know, the, the breaks of the song. So we knew it. We kind of listened to what they were doing. And then we heard these records and we were like, oh, that's what they're doing. And then we would try to do it there. You know, whatever little time we got in that bedroom, you know, to be on that little system with, with, uh, with uh, you know, with the break beats, we were trying to extend them, you know, and um, make them longer. Right. You know, whether it's mixing them or cutting them, you know, and, and, and that's pretty much uh, how it started, man. But I was always listening to music on the radio and um, there was a jazz station. I can't remember. Was it WWRL? I can't remember exactly. Of course, WBLS was. Yeah, uh, so BLS was in New York at that time. Yeah, the BLS, and there was another station near that area. I can't uh, um, on the Dalton, uh, but I can't remember the name of WWRL. Does that sound right? That's that was another station. Yeah, that 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 private station that they were getting grants from everybody. Yes, it was so cool because you were hearing like Eddie Palmieri, and then you would hear like a jazz record. I mean, but you would hear War. You know, and, and on that station, you would hear that kind of stuff. And I was like, wow, I like this station. You know, my brother-in-law used to listen to that, my Myrna's uh, ex-husband. And um, I'll never forget uh, the, the, the music I heard there was just blowing me away. You know, because I didn't hear that on the pop stations. Um, right. And WABC, you know what I'm saying? And then on WBLS, you heard, you know, amazing, you know, soul music, R&B, everything. You know, and you had uh, later on Frankie Crocker, you know, or even during that time, right? Um and, um, you know, it was just so rich in music, you know, and as a kid, even at, I mean, we were so lucky to experience that music at such a young age, you know, um, because I think that had a lot to do with who we are today. You know? Oh, 100%. 100%. I think a lot of us chase that dream in our heads still. We're still chasing that dream, like what we remember what we heard when we were kids. You know, yeah. well, 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 I think that we try to keep that spirit alive. I definitely do. When I make music, I try to keep that spirit alive. And for me, it's all about if uh, the music touches you, you know, you, you get chills when you hear it and it does something like that to you. When it does something like that to me in, in a studio and then I take it to a club and play it and it does something like that to the people, uh, it, it, it really uh, is an emotional thing for me, you know, and I try to keep that spirit of what i grew up with within my music today whether it's you know just a bare track or or a full-on production so for people who don't know do you have formal musical training well you know my father being a musician um of course he's like uh i want you to take piano lessons i'm like okay and then <laughs> okay <yeah>. right okay <laughs> <laughs> Ages, uh, ages six to eleven, I took uh, classical piano. Okay. Know, uh, That's when, awesome. when I was in school, I also I played violin. Uh, so uh, I, I was in a glee club. You know what I'm saying? I, I kind of started getting more involved in music in any way that I can in school. You know, I don't really talk about that, but I did do those things when I was a kid. But you have to understand, Louis. People are so impressed with what you do, bro. So unless they're on your shoulder and watch, they don't really know. So that's why I ask my friends, you know, how, how, how extensive is the musical training? Because to be, I always felt to be really good at what you do, you must have to understand some part of it, musically speaking, to be really good at it, you know? Well, to, well definitely, man. You, you know, you want to learn as much as you can. Uh, to me, if I could do it all over again, I would want to, I would wish that I would learn, kept with the music after age 11, because there was a gap between 11 and 22 where uh, I was just into other things. You know, you're talking about going to discos, going to clubs, right. roller skating. I was a heavy, I was a full on roller skater, like five, six days a week, 
for four years straight. I'm talking about, I really went out like that. You know, I love the music and I went to clubs at the same time. So um, uh, for me, uh, growing up with those things, uh, really, uh, it, it was kind of practice for me, you know what I mean, with, 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 uh, with music. Uh, but when I played the piano, yeah, it taught me about pitch. I know when a singer is not singing on, you know what I'm saying? I know when something's flat, when something's sharp. You know, I learned those kind of things, you know what I mean? Not, not super heavy. I didn't, you know, I can read music a little bit, but I don't, I'm not a heavy reader. You know, um, of course I, I should be. But um, later on, um, I needed those things. You know what I mean? So I said to myself, wow, I should have hung on with it. But then uh, when, I, uh, when I was in my mid-20s, uh, I went back to the piano lessons again. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, I did. I did. And um, I had some of the greats, you know, teach me piano because by that time I started in uh, in the early 90s. I, I would say 1990, 89, 90. I started already um, um, meeting a lot of people in the business. So uh, I want to say a big thank you to Oscar Hernandez from the Spanish Harlem Orchestra, who was my piano teacher. Oh, and, wow. And Ricky Gonzalez, who was a uh, uh, did a lot of arrangements and 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 worked with Ray Barreto a lot. He was my piano teacher as well, and they taught me a lot. To this day, I still have the sheets that they wrote out oh, you wow. know, for me. You know, uh, music theory and, and stuff that that I I gave to my son now, and he's you know he's gone through it. You know what I'm saying? So um, legacy you. continues, right? <laughs> yeah. <man. laughs> mm -hmm. Now I remember you had. You were also part of IDRC, if I remember correctly. Okay, now, and also I remember you played in the Bronx because I was a Sure Shot member. Sure, I worked, I was with Bobby Davis. I remember you were playing a lot. So I remember you were playing the Bronx. So let's take us from high school. I know the high school gap to DJing wasn't long because you were quite young. I remember when you got your first breaks. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're talking early 80s, 1980. Uh, I, um, even the late seventies. Cause I started playing at what, like 13 years old, 12, 13 around there. And, um, there was a DJ and another DJ in my neighborhood. His name was Raul. And, um, he had a great disco collection and I loved, uh, at the time, you know, remember it was the mid seventies to, 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 to late seventies. That was the, forget about all, it. All, the all about it. All about disco. And he had like 10 crates and I was like, wow all this music in here he just had great taste in music and so um what, what i did was i started kind of hanging out with him and and i'm um, helping him because he was a mobile dj and he would do sweet 16s and weddings so i said you know what let me help him and you know I, I can help you i'll carry the records i'll help you set up you know and everything and stuff like that and and in return you know he would loan me i would say could i could i borrow for two weeks, just borrow your turntables, your mixer, and and two crates of records. Let me pick the songs that I like, and that's what I did. That's how I started. You know what I'm saying? And and from there, um, I think that's what gave me a lot of uh, you know the way I mix disco music, especially you know you know the, I'm talking about the records from back in the days, the, you know the, the full on live things, not not the ones that we've gridded and and made a lot easier to mix. It's, it's all good and everything, but those records I learned from that. You know right. what I'm saying? From the pure uh uh 12 inches that came out back in those days. And um, you know, barring it for two weeks here and there is what really gave me those chops to 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 listen to music and listen to the arrangements and and hear the breaks and and you know and extending them and and hearing the songs when they speed up, when they slow down. Cause it, you know, you're talking about live musicians, you know, it wasn't like a drum machine you know, back in those days. So um, I just really enjoyed it. And I said, man, I love doing this. I really love doing this. And, and uh, little by little, I, as I was doing the mobile gigs, making a little money here, a little money there, getting your allowance. And, and next thing you know, I bought a set of tables and you know, turntables and um, and uh, my own mixer, you know. Um, was it 1200? So what did you want to get? What was the first setup? I believe it was SLD ones. That's not right. That's, well, the B ones with belt drives. Uh-huh. And the D ones are the direct, but the, the platters were small. When you turn it, when you turn, you know, yeah. you, you keep sticking up with that one. That's the one I had. And um, <laughs> yes, you know, it, it was a Gemini mixer because I couldn't afford the GLI 9000s and all that. I, had, I was like, you had to have big money for that stuff back then, bro. You know, come on. And then, 
And then I had another friend who had these amazing Sirwin Vega speakers. And he, he, he's the one that, he actually gave me his turntables. And those were my first 1200s. It was about 81, somewhere around there. And I had these, uh, this big Sirwin Vega, it was so dope. It had like an 18 inch woofer and a, a mid range and a tweeter and, or two tweeters. And um, I used that to play music in the early eighties and um, just to mix every single day, you know, that I could, you know. Um, and um, th that's it from there, uh, you know, started doing those parties with, with, with some friends of mine in the neighborhood. Uh, one of them was, uh, John Gungi Rivera, he is. Oh yeah, John Gungi, another legendary. Yeah, he, um, we started together a long time ago and we were doing these parties at the YMCA and uh, we were bringing like 1,100 people, you know, and we're like, wow. And, but at that time I was already doing high school parties, you know, at Stevenson High School in the Bronx. Gotcha. And, um, and, um, and, and some other high schools and, and some Sweet 16s. And it's crazy because those kids that were in those parties, they were started to follow me wherever I played. If I was doing another party somewhere else, those kids from that YMCA or from that YMCA party or from those from the Stevenson High School parties or from some of those 316s would go to these places and we say, man, we we gotta start, you know, let's let's do some more parties like this, you know? And um, you know, as I started doing um more and more parties, the people it was growing, you know, you're talking about the Bronx and Word of mouth. Swinging it back to to the uh, short record pool, yep. you know, um, I, you know, all this is happening at the same time. There's so much more even happening that I can't get to, but I'm trying to. Um, there was a, long a neighbor, time ago. <laughs> another another neighbor of mine. His name was Lenny. You know, he had a Paradise Garage membership. He went to the Paradise Garage, and I always remember he had this Camaro. It was so dope. His car. And he had a great sound system, and he would play in his sound system, Steely Dan, like he loves Steely Dan. And I would just ride around with him in the car and listen to Steely Dan, like in the wee hours of the night, you know, it was crazy. We were just so into music. And he says, you know, I'm, I'm the member of this club called a paradise garage. You know, I want to take you there, Louis. Cause you know, it, it's crazy. Cause a lot of the people that were around me, whether it was my sisters, my neighbors, my friends, you know, that were older, they saw how ambitious I was and how, passionate i was about this that they tried in any way to help you know to you know introduce me to something that might spark up more stuff you know what i mean so sure. is, i want to take you to the garage you know i i you know you're really young you're only 15 but i could i think i could get you in on a membership night you know and 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 my sister edna was already going there this is this is 1980 so my my sister edna had a cousin there you know you know um uh who worked at the garage you know um and um we got in they got me in i was like this little kid imagine if i'm you know little louis and with I'm, me and that 15 years old i'm like some i look like i was 12 you know what right. i'm saying when i was 15. <laughs> you know so but i got in i was like wow I'm with them you know and um you know uh, the same guy lenny introduced me to bobby shaw from shaw record pool and and Bobby Shaw was nice enough to give me records, you know, some of the, a lot of those promos, you know, because I was starting it at that time. So I had a lot of friends. I had another friend who his brother owned a record pool on Castle Hill. Uh, what's it called? On, on VIP on, on, Al Pizarro? No, not VIP. The other one. Um, I'm trying to remember. I don't remember all the. Promos. I knew Al Pizarro too. I knew Al Pizarro too. I know you do. I know this is all the old names. I I don't I don't remember the other guy in the Bronx. Hernandez. Hernandez is the last name. Lem. No, Lem worked with you at IDRC. No, not Lem, not Lem. That's way oh. later. Uh, I'm talking about way back. Um, yeah, actually, my friend's name, I believe, was Lem too in 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 high school, and um, he, his older brother, owned that record pool on Castle Hill. That I don't know. Okay, well, um, in that record pool, he, he his brother gave him his younger brother a ton of records, who was my friend, and he gave me records that I still have today. I'm talking about early, was about early 80s. We're talking about, you know, Denver and Morgan. Right. We were talking about um, Land of Hunger, like all those records that came out at that time, you know, um, situation, you know, all that stuff. And, and he, you know, a lot of, like I said, a lot of people were helping me out because they saw I was really 
hint to it. And I didn't have money like that to be dropping the bottle. Bro, you had the eye of the tiger. I remember when I first met you, man. You had the eye. You had that. Still have it. But back then, it was a different eye. It was a different world back then. We were all hunger, hungry to get that chance. So go ahead. Take us in that Bronx roll. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're that's doing, tough, that's we're, tough. You gotta give it to us. You gotta let, let, teach. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, we're doing it in the Bronx. You know, a lot of my friends. You know, like I said, Lenny uh, introduced me to, to to Bobby Shaw. You had my friend from high school introducing me to his big brother, who had uh, the record for Castle Hill. And um, you know, uh, just kept on putting together parties and doing things, and eventually. Um, I did a few parties with Gungi. We did, we did a handful of parties together. And then I, I went and uh, tried to do this party at a, a club in, on a street called Zariga in the Bronx. And that club was the only club in the Bronx that had a Richard Long sound system. It had a Richard Long sound system, but the club was closed because it was that thing when disco, you know, the whole thing with disco yep. happened. There was a little period when a lot of these clubs closed they didn't they didn't make it through the business or whatever and you know it was just lying dormant there and um but the system was still there so we went to meet the owner to see the place and i was like wow this is a richard long system we're talking 80 83 84 now right 84 so um i couldn't believe that it was the same guy who made the system in the paradise garage he made this like little spot up in the bronx i was like no way it's not and, possible you say right you think yeah. it's not possible the speakers were there i saw them so then um and the the, the i remember the, the the crossover everything so anyway so um i mean i'm not sure if he went and built that there but his signature was there gotcha. you know, and, and it sounded dope so um anyway i did i did a party there in uh, 84 and uh, by that time, I was already playing from disco to early uh, 80s electro to hip hop, you know, um, DOR, the new wave sound. I was playing That's all right. DOR, dance oriented rock, everyone. Yeah, right. Remember that? Dance, I told C that he knows. DOR, dance oriented rock. You had yeah, to play yeah. it in those days. That was what The Clash, all those records fit in that. Well, we place. loved it. We loved it, man. It was great. Right. Music. It was great music, so and it still is. So, you know, uh, did this party, and uh, my sister, uh, who I said went to the loft back in '71, she had a hair shop. She's a, 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 a beautician. A, a beautician. Okay. So um, she owned a place up in uh, near Holy Cross, which is on Soundview uh, in the Bronx. Uh, so we used her place to sell tickets to the event that we were doing in Zariga Avenue. So that was like the base for people to buy tickets. So, you know, there was no internet. There was nothing like that. You know, you promote with flyers and you say tickets available here and they got to go there to buy it. Right. Next, you know, we sold about, what, uh, seven, 800 tickets to this. So you're running like Ticketron out of your sister's spot. <laughs> <laughs> parties. Like a you Ticketron. I mean? He's like, yo, go to my, my sister's spot and get the <laughs> tickets over there. Got you. Oh, okay. it did. Like 84, man. 212. So, in those days, it was one area code, 212. They didn't have no 718 yet. It was 212 everywhere. <laughs> right, right. Look at that. So, um, you know, uh, we did this party and I said, you know what, I got to get an artist to. Uh, perform uh and at that time you know uh it was the early very beginnings of of uh latin hip-hop freestyle which is uh music that kind of was born in around that time 84 85 um and there was one song called please don't go it was on fever records and it was uh written and produced by andy panda fred mcfarlane played on it he played piano right. on it and uh, Niobe was the lead singer, and um, the owner of the label, Viva Records, is Sal Abatello. So I was able to book Niobe to perform there. And when I did, Sal Abatello saw this place, and he saw these kids. It was packed, you know, 700 kids. And he says, we got to get this kid, man, to play in our club. You know, and I didn't know he was opening up a club. And then he said, hey, I'm opening up. You know, I have this club that I'm just, just opened, or it was opening or something like that. Or, um, and I'm looking for DJs and I think you would be great for it. I said, like, okay. And then um, from there, I went to go see the club and um, I started playing on Friday nights. Okay. And I started playing on Friday nights, all those kids, because we was, you know, we, you know, we was hungry out there promoting, letting kids know, yo, we're going to be here. And 
remember, these are the same kids that were in the high schools in the Sweet Sixteens in the right. early eighties. They were a little bit older now. They, you know, got their little style going on. Jobs, dancing, Jobs. In, their thing. That you know, what I'm saying, you know, and um, they just flew down to the Devil's Nest, and it, it, that's the name of the club. It was called the Devil's Nest. So we're talking '85 now, and club opened up to a whirlwind of people. There was already people going there, but when I went there, this other group of people went there. That it was really uh, packed out the spot, and um, you know, um, at the same time, in, in, when I met Andy Panda and and, and Salabatello, it was Andy Panda who introduced me to the Latin Rascals. You know. Um, because uh, they were. Can you tell? Players. Can you tell the people who's the Latin Rascals the names of the guys so they know? Because yeah. yes, Andy Pan is a songwriter and producer who who produced probably the earliest Latin hip hop freestyle record. Latin hip hop and freestyle was a movement of music uh, that came from the Bronx. It was you know, um, and the boroughs too, Brooklyn, everywhere. But you know, Bronx, I was playing at the club that introduce that music to everyone put it that way i was in this club you know because niobe was there she did one of the early ones you had lisa lisa nicole jam what i want about take you home you had the early 80s sound the whole shannon and electro uh sound that jelly bean was playing you know um so there's a new crew of kids that are making music and then you had the latin rascals who were amazing djs on the radio, they were doing these edits, and you know they came up with a with a with a style of editing that was so incredible and creative. It was not easy to do that. Not everybody could do that. There was a handful of guys that would do that, you know, at that time, you know. But the Latin Rascals were one of the uh, pioneers of it, of of the kind of mixes they used to do on the radio. You know, they used to spend hours and hours editing, but when you hear the way they edited, it was it was art. You know, so well put. I met um, the Latin Rascals uh, through Andy Panda, and when we all got together, we were like, "Oh, they, they started." They were like, "Oh, we're making this music. We're going to record these artists." You know, we have uh, Andy Panda and Sal had a group called the Cover Girls. You know, uh, Latin Rascals were like, "We're producing this new group called TKA." You know, what I'm saying, um, and. You know, for me, it was like, oh, my, I met these legends. It was like, you know, the Latin Rascals, damn. You know, I used to love their mixes on the radio, and, the, and, and they were doing a lot of work with Arthur Baker at the time, you know, in those uh, earlier years, you know, a couple of years earlier, all through that, you know, that, that time. And um, to meet them and to meet Andy, who wrote this incredible song called Please Don't Go with um, Niobe uh, singing lead. Um, it was just like, wow, it couldn't get any better than that. At the same time, I was working in a record pool. It's called IDRC, you know. Um, so like I said, you know, I'm this hungry kid. Yeah, and, and, you know, if there's a little opening there that says, oh, you want to come check this out, you know, and it's, 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 you could, you know, you could meet people, you can get some music, you can, uh, learn about artists, you can see this, you know, listen, I was there, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and I didn't even mention Jelly Bean. And Jelly Bean had a lot to do with my early career, too. You know what I'm saying? Because uh, you we were going to ask, I was going to get to that in a minute because I was going to ask about that later about okay, the so we could get back to Keep him. going, keep going. You're, good. You're so, doing really good. Yeah, so, you know, um, well, okay, the, the, the record pool, um, there were these break dances that I knew. And, um, and 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 they were working with the record pool because the record pool uh, IDRC they used to do these uh, street jams like you know they used to uh, with Kiss along with the, ra the radio station one of the big stations for us at that time for New York City was you know Kiss FM ninety eight point seven Kiss FM and um, Eddie Rivera who owned IDRC he used to do all of the uh, the the street the shows. In, on like black parties, kind of. Right. They were Live uh, sessions with a lot of artists and stuff, right? Yeah, like he would bring this flatbed, 18-wheeler uh, flatbed, and that was the stage. Yeah. Boom, on top of that, you put all the speakers, this huge wall of speakers, wall of sound, and then they would put the DJ in front of the the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 18 with a flatbed thing. Right. The stage. And then on the stage, you had all the artists that performed. So, um... You know, I had met Eddie, Eddie Rivera and the, and the whole IDRC staff, Dennis Rivera and everybody through um, 
through uh, these break dances that brought me out there. They were, you know, uh, I got a shout out Marilyn, who I remember, look at that, long time ago, she introduced me to uh, Eddie Rivera and the whole crew. And then from there, um, I became part of the staff. There was about 25, 30 people that would help to put these things together, these, these street jams. Oh, wow. And they were heavily promoted on the radio on KISS because it was, uh, you know, it was, they were all working together, you know. So Eddie Rivera would promote in the streets and he would also, uh, you know, promote on uh, the station would do these commercials and Eddie would put together the shows because he had these nights in the record pool and everybody knows what record pool is, right? Well, I, I'm, I'm sure you've taught them by now what a record pool is. <laughs> well, let's get them, let's hear it from you, my friend. Okay, break it down. A record pool, you know, uh, there were DJs uh, who played in clubs and the DJs that played in clubs, they would uh, pay a fee to this organization and uh, it, it's called a record pool and the record pool would get promos from major labels, independent labels everywhere and you would pay this monthly fee and you would get about, let's say, 30 records a month, 30, 40 records a month in a box, you know, but you have to do your feedback and you, you, know, you, do, you know, they would have these feedback sheets and these listening sessions. Actually, Eddie Rivera, he was popular for that because he do, did these Monday night feedback sessions. That's right. Monday night. Yeah, I remember that. A dope system and his big loft and he would just, all the DJs would come together. He had about 125 DJs. That's right. So, so I was not only in the staff working uh, to put the shows together with, of course, the whole crew. I was, you know, uh, I, I was driving the artists. I was, I, I'll never forget, I picked up Fonda Ray. I wow. picked up um, Unlimited Touch, uh, the band, um, some of the band members. No, uh, don't do me no favors. What, what group is Anthony that? Malloy, Anthony, Anthony uh, uh, Temper. Um, Anthony Malloy. And, um, goodness. Uh, I, was, I, I was driving around and, and picking up the artists and bringing them to perform. And I was driving the band because I had a license, you know, of course, at, at that time. And um, at, then during the day, I would work in the record pool to put all the records in the bins. Like you had what I have back here. You know, imagine having 125 of these. They were losing you, brother. Hang on, you. I think we lost. There you are. Okay, we. I think we lost where you. Hey, you, you turn your mic back on. Your mic shut down. Asked from you. Okay. Let me Maybe. let me pick it up from where we left. We lost you. We said you said I was the one who had the license and the keys. You would drive around the artist, and then it. it, 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 it we. Well, I was the one who had a. a I mean, I was one of the guys who had a a, a driver's license, so I would pick up the artists, bring them to perform, and then bring them back. You know, I would also help to set up in the early mornings. So um, then during the week, I, uh, I got a regular job at the record pool, and I was the one putting the records in for the DJs. So imagine having 125 of these things I have back here, you know, and everyone has a DJ's name, you know, and it's uh, 125 DJs that played in the tri-state area clubs and mobile DJs, whatever, you know, these are DJs that were paying their monthly fees and doing their feedback and doing all that. So I worked in the record pool under Dennis Rivera, right. who, who uh, ran the record pool. And um, I would give the DJs their records. So I was meeting a lot of DJs and it was so cool because, you know, I was already DJing, but I was meeting other DJs and I was DJs that were doing things. And wow, it was like one of the DJs was in Mandrill, the group. Right. Um, Oh, wow. And um, there was another one, uh, Don Welch. Don Welch was <laughs> who I met later on in the years. You know, he was in the record pool too. That's you know, right. And, yeah, there was a lot of uh, 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 amazing DJs that were in the pool. And um, but, so I would meet them every week because they would come pick up their records. Louis, how yeah. important was it back in the day to be in a record pool? How important was that? Tell people, that was yeah. like crazy, man. We were dying to get the record pool, remember? Everybody wanted to be in a record pool, of course, but you had to work in a club. Right. You know, legitimate club. Or you had to be a mobile DJ, but not just a normal mobile DJ. You had to have, like, some serious work behind you. Like what you were doing at parties. Big numbers yeah, of people. Well, especially, the, well, I don't know, because, well, yeah, I was steady in 85 up, but, you know, we're talking 84. When I was in record pool, I worked there for, like, a year. So, um, you know, but, but I wasn't uh, consistently working where I could be in a pool like that. But since I worked in a pool, of course, I got my, my box of records, you know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it was cool. You met a lot of people, especially those Monday night feedback parties. They were, uh, you know, Columbia Records would come and they would bring a, a 
super dope artists that you would never think you would meet uh, to come perform there or they would you know, come there to meet the DJs and, and, and get feedback on their hot new song out, you know, and stuff like that. You know, so um, it, it was really a wonderful, uh, you know, environment. It was very social, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, there were two big record, the two of the biggest record pools in New York City, I would say it was uh, For the Record, which is Judy Weinstein and uh, David Morales, and you know, um, but they had the, you talking about they had- Creme de la creme, creme de la creme. The creme de la creme of DJs, um, Larry yeah. Levine and Tony Humphreys, like everybody, I, I remember when I met Judy and she was telling me, I mean, when I first met Judy, I mean, of course I know Judy now, I love you, Judy, but you always used to say, you know, you belong in this record. <laughs> you told me that all the time, I always say, no, well, man. You say that when you're at the hot spot now, when you're at, and she was like, why are you not over here? Yeah, yeah. She's like, she you saying, yeah, why are you not here? I'm like, because you didn't want me? But you couldn't <laughs> say that. You know, you were like, yeah, yeah. But you already felt you had allegiance to Eddie, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Or Bobby Davis was the one that opened the doors to you. You know, it's like, yeah. I'm never here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But, yo, yeah, she had the creme of the creme. It was just watching, seeing the names that were on, on her Rasta. It was a who's who of, of the dance music industry. It's the whole industry was right there. <laughs> but, you know, Eddie Rivera had, had some dope DJs, too. Oh, yeah. He just had the, you know, the, 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 the golden Rasta, you know. But, um, you know, so I just did that for a year. And it wasn't until uh, the sometime in 84, um, there was a party for Justin Brown on a Monday night feedback, uh, one of the Monday night feedback parties. And... Um, Jocelyn Brown came. I, I couldn't believe I met her. I was like, wow, that was the first time I met her. And, sure. Uh, and Jellybean came because he had that big deal with Warner Brothers. Yes. His and, album deal, right? It was right now on that time. Yep. Exactly. And he he signed Jocelyn Brown as one of his uh, first uh, artists. And um, when he came down, that's when he met me and said, hey, you know, I've been hearing a lot about you, man. You know, we're both from the Bronx. And... Um, you know, I heard you, you play great music and you're a great DJ. And I said, well, you know, and he goes, if you ever want to come into the studio and, you know, just sit in the back or whatever and just, you know, check it out. You have any questions or whatever, uh, let me know. So, you know, I wasn't letting that go. I was like, you know what? I, I'm, gonna call <laughs> I'm calling this guy right away. What, how long did it take you to call him? How long would you say? Well, first of all, I got I to gotta, uh, give it up to him because when he was tanned it up in the Fun House, which is an incredible club uh, back mm -hmm. in the 80s, I used to go in the early 80s there. Um, after I went to the garage in 80, I, I never stopped going to clubs. You know what I'm saying? I went to clubs just to experience all these DJs that were amazing, you know, because I'll tell you the DJs. There was that, a lot of great talent back then. Yes, yes, yes. And, um, you know, when um, I, I used to sit in that bass bottom in that club and just hear him play and you know, you look up in the booth and you see, you know, Madonna hanging out there when they were a couple at the time. And you hear, um, you know, um, you see Arthur Baker giving him a reel to reel. I mean, you saw a new order hanging out there. I mean, it was mind blowing. And then to, to know that I met him later on, you know, uh, it, it, it was really. Uh, were you starstruck by him at first? Did yeah, you have that feeling, that feeling yeah, yeah. of starstruck? Because that's how I felt with a lot of those guys when you first met them. Of course, them. of course, man. Listen, you're buying somebody's music. Um, right. You know what I'm saying? Uh, who, who has made amazing music for, for so many years, you know, for a number of years. And um, you, you're, you're seeing them play in a club, in a, in a dream club with an incredible sound system. Um, and, you know, you're, you're seeing them do their thing, too. You know what I'm saying? And, and um, for me, to to meet him in person and to see that he was giving me a little props, a little bit of props for what I was doing at the time was cool. And then to invite me to his place of work, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and where he creates, you know? So I was like, wow. So, you know, um, and you go running, where's this? And what, what was going on? Break us down, bring us right into that session. Who, what, when, where? And, and, and listen, um, <laughs> well, you know, the thing is that, Right after that party, when we had met, we started hanging out and talking a lot. And then he took me under his wing at that time. So he introduced me to a lot of people. You know, at the same time, I'm working with the Latin Rascals. We're making music. It's, we, we, you know, we're in 85 right now. You know, when I'm at the Devil's Nest, you know. Um, so you're making music and you're breaking it at the same time. Because I know that was always your style. 
You're making it and you're breaking it. That's how you roll. You've always been that way from what I remember. Yeah. And I think, you know, the thing is that there's an art to, you know, um, when you're breaking a record, you know, first of all, every DJ has their own style. You know, every DJ has their own thing and how they, you know, um, get people into music. Because in those days, we used to get people into it, you know, because there could be records that were clear the floor when you were played in the beginning. But once the way you play it and how, you know, you, how um, you present it, you know, within your set, and and then you, and then you play it again later on, and then you play by that third time they're singing that hook, then you know you've done something right. You know what I'm saying? It's like, that, that's uh, or, or that flaw just erupts. You know that that that's how you you kind of know. And those what guys, a high! I don't care what drug you're on. You don't need to be on a drug with that. That's a drug in itself to get that that knowing that you made that record and that crowd gives you that love back yeah. and they scream. You know that feeling. So, you know, so, you know, so, so Jelly Bean, the first thing he did was he was like, you know, I want to get you to, you know, maybe you can get to mix some records and stuff like that. You know, but um, at the same time, I'm working with the Latin Rascals. Uh, when I'm playing at the club, you know, people bringing me music. And then I met Joey Gardner and Joey Gardner worked at Tommy Boy Records and he managed TKA. Okay. So, so Joey Gardner uh, comes to me and says, hey, you know, I want you to do a remix on a record. I said, a remix. I said, you know, what am I going to do? <laughs> I didn't know. I'm like, what am I going to do? He goes, man, you, well, listen, right now you just, let's go into the studio. It's going to be a great engineer. And um, you're going to listen to the tracks and, and tell them what, you know, what you hear more of, what you hear less of, but, you know, just, uh, it was pretty basic. Okay. But it was interesting because when I went to the, you know, I was already, you know, checking out you know, I went to see Arthur Baker in the studio, the Latin Rascals, when they were working with Arthur Baker. I was in the studio with Andy Panda and checking him out. I was, um, you know, just, and then Jelly Bean. So then I said, you know what? I'm watching all these guys doing what they do. I said, let me, let me, let me, uh, let me see what I hear. Let me, let's do it. You know, so it was Tommy Boy Records, you know, uh, and the first song that I ever mixed was a song called Running by Information Society. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. Yes. Larry LeVan, everybody killed that record, but woo. I didn't know Larry LeVan played that record, but it, it was a pretty big record. It was you know, a so big record. Yes. The thing is that I just what I what I was doing was I, I thought to myself, okay, well, I got to bring out the best elements in this record. And I, when I heard the record, I said, man, listen to these toms, these eight hundred eight hi hats. How come they're not up? It's, it's so buried. It's like you don't feel it. I said, let's bring them up. Let's bring them up. And, you know, I was just bringing up things. I said, you know, I hear a little more low end on this. I started already hearing that stuff from, I guess, playing in clubs and watching the other guys, you know what I'm saying, in the studio. Um, pretty much bringing up what I wanted to hear. And, of course, I knew about arrangement. That was my thing, you know, so because of playing music. And right. Musical background. So, um, the, but the engineer, let's give it up to Eric Calvi. I mean, you know, you're talking about. Oh yeah, dope. Oh yeah, engineers. Yeah, I mean, he he was the engineer on running, so I couldn't go wrong. I had the right engineer right there, you know. Who were you was. nervous? I mean, were you nervous walking to that first session, controlling the helm? Seriously? Or well, you know, I I did. I wasn't nervous because I went to it was in Tom Silverman's apartment, and it was in the nineties in uh, New York City. Right. I'm talking. Nineties, the streets. So. Right, not, no, because that's the eighties. That record, I know. I was gonna say. Yeah, no, no, no. It's uh, in the in the nineties, ninety sixth Street, ninety seventh Street, whatever, somewhere around there. I mean, I can say it now because he don't definitely don't live there no more. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, it was a high riser, and yep. um, you know, I went into the studio. He had a really wonderful studio in his house because by that time he already put out Planet Rock, Force and these. I mean, he had. Oh it. yeah, yeah, and huge, crazy. Yeah, huge. Crazy. Crazy. Eighty five, you know, when I went in, so um. When I went uh, to mix the records, you know, did my thing there with Joey Gardner, of course. He was there, too. We were together and, and Eric Calvi, the uh, engineer. Um, so I wasn't that nervous. It was really comfortable. And Tom Silverman was really welcoming. He was really nice when, you know, when I came in and stuff. And, you know, uh, everybody was really down to earth and humble. So, you know, I was humbled by all that, you know, but I got to say. But um, when we finished the, the, the record and... and you know, uh, the group had this like 
sort of like a sample live feel, all these sounds going in and out. And it was Paul Robb, genius, Paul Robb, a uh, producer who produced Information Society and Noel and all these other groups. Um, you know, I, I just brought out those elements. And, and I said, you know what, man, we need some dope edits. I got to go to my boys, the Latin Rascals. And that's when I, uh, uh, I called up the, the fellas in, and, uh, I mean, uh, Albert um, Cabrera and um, Tony Moran. And, and um, I sat with them through hours, you know, I'm talking about a whole night to the next day and then the next day to the next, you know, just to do these edits for this record. And it came out so awesome. And then it came time to play the record. And when I played it at the Devil's Nest, the place erupted, man. It was incredible, you know? Um, and then that's when we said, okay, well, you know, Sal said, we got to have this group here. And we had Information Society perform live there. And there was lines, I'm talking about in the Bronx, around the block, you know, both sides and on the roof of the club, like people were just wanting to get in. It was like Andy Patton and Sal were like fighting the crowd off, like, please, you know, whatever, you know, with, with their <laughs> security. It was just crazy. And I'm in there downstairs playing. It was, it was a low level club. Right. You know, but, um, you know, um, even when the group came, they were like, we're going to the Bronx. Oh my goodness. They were from, uh, Mid what, Minneapolis? I think they're from Minneapolis. Yeah. Midwest. I, if I remember. And, um, you know, they were blown away by Well, the because in the beginning, those days, when you said the Bronx, bro, everybody thought it was bad, like really bad. Now, you know, they're not thinking, you know, like now. Things were different back then. The neighborhoods were rough, some of the neighborhoods you went into. Oh, no, they were rough. Yeah, the neighborhood definitely was definitely rough where the devil's I remember was. how rough yeah. that area was. Rough at night. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was, <laughs> it was rough. So I can yeah. understand these, these white cats coming in from Minneapolis going, going to boogie down Bronx. They're thinking South Bronx. They've been watching those films with the buildings burning. Yeah, not, yeah, yeah. You know, they're not thinking, oh, it's going to be, we're going to be safe. Don't worry. You know, everything's going to be cool. 